Oh, fantastic. This is so fun. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our April edition of Naturalist Night. I am excited to be here tonight to learn about the Irvine Laguna Wildlife Corridor. We have three of the team members here with us tonight to discuss that project. Um, tonight, we are going to have time for questions at the end. So if you want to kind of hold on to your questions, um, there will be time for Q&A at the end. But if you have a question as we go through, feel free to type it into the chat. They will be keeping an eye on the chat. And if they see a, a relevant question, they might just jump in and answer it as we go through. Um, so I'm going to start off by introducing our first presenter, Terry Watt. Terry uh, has a background in planning. Many of you may know her as Jean Watt's daughter. And she is the strategic advisor to the Laguna Greenbelt for the Wildlife Corridor. Welcome on in, Terry. Thank you so much, Hillary and uh, Gabby. Let's put up the, the show. First, just the intro. Here we go. <laughs> Love technology. All right. Well, this Earth Month, we are delighted to have this opportunity to update you on the progress being made to finish a decades long effort connecting the Cleveland and the coast with a functioning wildlife corridor. Uh, this corridor stretches through the heart of Orange County, the third most, most dense county in California through a, a very urbanized uh, area um, and lies largely, the, the reaches we'll be talking about tonight lie largely in the city of Irvine, one of our principal partners. In preparing for tonight, our team, I will introduce in a moment, enjoyed refreshing our understanding of your important work um, and essential mission, protection and preservation of Upper Newport Bay through restoration, education, research, and advocacy. And also your acknowledgement that your work as ours takes place on the ancestral lands of native peoples. Next slide, Gabby. Uh, so the, the Irvine Laguna Wildlife Corridor is a project of Laguna Greenbelt. And uh, I wanna give a special shout out to this decades in the making corridor to Elizabeth Brown, who's um, not here tonight, but is a science, an ongoing science advisor to the project, and also Mary Fagris. Without their dedication, and frankly, um, the Laguna Greenbelts, we wouldn't be here to talk about the progress we've made. So I'll be joined tonight in presenting by two other people who, one of whom is on and also staffs the working group, Lance Valerie. Lance is a board member of Laguna Greenbelt. He's a member of the working group. And as you will see later tonight, he brings his planning and GIS talents to bear on the virtual tour you'll see, you'll see tonight, which is really a fundamental underpinning of the project work we're doing. And Gabby uh, will also be pre presenting tonight. Uh, she, like me, um, staffs the Laguna Greenbelt and the working group, and her area of expertise uh, is communications, media, and social media. Many of you might have enjoyed the articles um, you periodically see about the corridor pro progress in the news. That's all Gabby's doing. Next slide. All right, this is a bit of a teaser for you all. Um, as I said, we looked at your mission and um, obviously you're doing great work, um, it's wonderful. And in a very tightly constrained geography, one square mile, if I got that right, and not counting obviously the watershed that feeds the upper Newport Bay. Um, but this slide is a bit of a teaser and Lance is gonna spend a little more time on it later. Um, we have a set of science advisors, one of whom um, is, uh, uh, Sanem Cargan, 
who for her thesis at UCI focused on those two little corridor reaches um, extending from the Newport Bay um, and did a lot of research on roadkill uh, along those two reaches. And so suffice it to say, we applaud your very focused mission, focused in geography, focused on effort, um, but we do see a potential connection between our work and yours, and we hope that's a topic for discussion later this evening or ongoing. Next slide. So, you know, why do corridors matter? Well, obviously maintaining connectivity of habitats helps preserve ecosystem health. And in the face of climate change, habitat loss and fragmentation and increasing human presence, the stressors on our wildlife have never been greater. The hard work to conserve core habitat in our county, the central and coastal natural community conservation areas and the upper Newport Bay is, is lost really without maintaining these connections to foster genetic diversity. Um, next slide. Many factors affect wildlife movement. Um, and as you'll hear from Lance, we did extensive camera work, camera study work that was preceded by collaring work to assess a lot of what was going on in our particular region so that we could fix the barriers for a functioning uh, corridor. So obviously factors affecting wildlife movement, you're no stranger to those a mountain type of vegetation, loss of contiguity, roads, fencing, pets, recreational uses, pesticides, lighting, noise, we could go on. But I'm going to just flag again for later, you know, human presence in the third most dense county in California is a huge factor. Um, and it's not just, you know, with COVID, that more people are recreating in areas that, that our wildlife before had more solace. But it's also the nuisance factor. We have spiking homelessness and obviously other, other stuff going on that you can't ignore as you're trying to create a functioning corridor, really the social factors. Next slide. All right, some of our, some of our species. So interesting choice of word extirpation, which I think we should change to extinction. Um, but in any case, uh, ex uh, extinction describes the situation in which a species or a population no longer exists in a certain location or geography. And without a functional connection between the Cleveland and the coast, the coast as a fairly isolated island, 22,000 acres in size, has species that face um, extinction, uh, a few of which you see on the slide here tonight and we'll be talking about later. Um, I am going to hand over the podium to my colleague Lance, um, and he's gonna take you through some slides that talk more granularly about the work underway. Thank and you very much. Also a little video or two. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Terry. I appreciate it. Uh, so we're gonna to try to show you some maps and try to show you what the wildlife corridor is, where it's located and how it uh, also connects with Upper Newport Bay. But first let's get sort of isolated here and look at what we're actually trying to do. Um, down the center of this, you have the I-5 freeway the 405, and they come together in the ultra Y in Irvine. And what we're essentially doing with our wildlife corridor, the Irvine Laguna Wildlife Corridor, is connecting the Santa Ana mountain area to the coastal wilderness area. 250,000 acres of open space and habitat uh, in the Cleveland National Forest area with the 22,000 acre coastal open space area, the Laguna Greenbelt. And that dotted line represents uh, approximately where the wildlife corridor is located. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is kind of an interesting slide. It's an oblique aerial. It shows the inland open space area, the very large 250,000 acres of open space that has genetic connectivity. You have functional habitat there. On the coast area, you don't have that really. It's become an island, it's fragmented, it's not connected anymore. And you can see from this slide that there used to be open space areas, but as this area became urbanized, development came and basically engulfed all of these areas. So this is really the only last connect connection that's available. It's about five to six miles back and forth between the two areas. And um, next slide, please. This is another great slide. Uh, prior to doing the work that we're doing, um, what, we're, what we've done is we've had uh, a series of, of camera studies that we initiated in the Irvine spectrum area. The purpose of these camera stations throughout Irvine spectrum was to try to get a gauge of what was going on with wildlife. Who was, what wildlife was using the area? How often were they using it? Where were they going? So we, working with their science advisors, and we'll talk a little bit about them later, we developed uh, what we thought were a series of pinch points. And based on those pinch points, we set up cameras. And from those cameras, the, the goal there was to try to see who was using it, uh, how often, and what the frequency of over, over an 18 month period. Next slide, please. So the findings were, uh, were very interesting and somewhat sad at the same time. Uh, I say sad because uh, the camera study verified also with the 2007 study, the collar study done by the USGS Illustrated. And that was that wildlife was not getting across the I-5 freeway. And so we know that that's an issue. It's a major issue to our wildlife corridor and it's something we're looking to try to fix. The second finding, I think that's probably the second most important finding of our camera study were that humans were the second most prevalent species in our camera study area. That is to say that everywhere that you had humans, wildlife activity decreased. And we, we noticed that in places where you had high volumes of human activity, you had much more, um, the wildlife simply disappeared from previous data that we've seen. Next slide, please. So you start to see that there are a number of issues uh, that emerge in this area. And what this map illustrates is the wildlife corridor condition or the different reaches. So on the right-hand side of this photo, you have the two, 250,000 acres of open space, the Cleveland National Forest area that I described earlier. And on the, uh, the left-hand side, you have the Laguna Greenbelt area, 22,000 acres. And in between linking those two areas, you have what we're calling two reaches or two different types of conditions. The planned reach, which is an area that was 178 acres zoned exclusively for wildlife. It was, uh, it was approved as part of a larger uh, Orange County Great Park uh, heritage fields approval in 2011, 2012. And it's basically the area that we are sort of least worried about in terms of connectivity. We know that this comes up and touches the federal property and the larger 250,000 acres. The, the more challenging piece is the remnant reach. That is basically where we're taking, uh, that's in the Irvine spectrum area. And it's basically where we're repurposing a series of flood control projects and trying to take unplanned wildlife corridor and try to bring them together into a cohesive uh, cohesive connection for wildlife that essentially goes from the I-5 freeway over to the edge of the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park. Combined, this area is about five miles long. That's fine, next slide, please. So this is a great photo, 
This is of the planned reach. This is the area where Five Point and the city, Five Point the developer and the city of Irvine are partnering and trying to build the widest portion of the wildlife corridor, the portion that is exclusively for wildlife. And it's one of the few, if not only wildlife corridor areas, I think, in an urbanized area in the Western United States that is set aside exclusively for wildlife. So when you think about that and you think about what the property values are, this is rather an amazing feat that we're actually building and setting aside land for wildlife in Orange County. So we really think that this is something uh, quite wonderful and it's our job to try to complete that connection through the Irvine spectrum area. Next slide, please. Next slide, Gabby. Oh, let's see, did we lose Gabby? Huh, uh, Gabby, can you hear me? I do, um, hmm. We didn't, we didn't anticipate this. Um, I, I um, for some reason I'm freezing up a little bit, but let me, let me try again. It's not allowing me to continue. Um, huh. Hillary, could do you want to? Uh, can you stop my screen share for me, by chance? Oh, here we go. No? Oh, oh, excellent. Okay. Okay. Now it's. Uh, I'm just going to proceed <laughs> here. Uh, that's that's just the way it works, you know. Just going to keep rolling. Um, so the area in green is the main portion of the wildlife corridor. It's the area in between the two large open space areas that I described. This slide illustrates different associated projects that we're building around the main wildlife corridor area. These individual projects, one, two, three, four, we think are going to help support wildlife function outside of the main wildlife corridor. These are in addition to trying to build the main wildlife corridor. There are things like looking at um, how the, the, the I-5 is going to work, uh, they're looking at things like what type of remediations and improvements can we make to the pinch points that I described earlier. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Gabby. So these boxes here are essentially pinch points within Irvine Spectrum. On the far left-hand side, you have the I-5 freeway. And then in between, you have sort of what we know as the, uh, the corridor as, as it exists today. And what we're trying to do in the project one area, in addition to trying to solve the big I-5 problem, we're trying to look at minor improvements that we think will really improve wildlife connectivity and functionality in this area. There are probably going to be things like uh, increased fencing, certain types of landscape uh, improvements to give wildlife better coverage. There are probably going to be things like setting up an educational component with neighboring landowners and residents to try to educate them about the wildlife corridor. These sort of, all of these things come together to try to uh, benefit wildlife in this immediate area, in addition to trying to study and fix the main I-5 problem. Next slide, please. So again, uh, these are three photos from within the project area. The first photo on our left-hand side is the Lake Forest Bridge. And as you can see, you have standing water and riprap. These are two examples of uh, conditions that we are trying to improve. We are most likely in this area to try to reduce the amount of standing water and or build some type of concrete ramp for wildlife so they can get across this riprap so that they can uh, during high water events, get through this area. The center slide, you start to see the same type of condition where you have riprap underneath these bridges that creates uh, issues. The other thing you have that we need to do is try to separate human activity that exists within the um, office and industrial areas and also future residential areas as they come online. We're trying to anticipate that. And Terry later is going to be talking about some of the future initiatives that we're looking at 
for edge conditions and model ordinances. Next slide, please. So what we're, I'm gonna to try to do now is take you on a little uh, fly through of the wildlife corridor working eastward to westward. Remember, we want wildlife primarily to go from the east to the west. We have a genetic uh, issue in the west. We don't have connectivity. And what we're hoping to try to do is get, for example, more bobcats to come from the Cleveland National Forest and be able to make it all the way into the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park and disperse from there. Gab, if you could click on the link. Okay, it might just take a second, sorry. It's, um... I'm not seeing that. Let's see. Let me, sorry, technical difficulties. Um, yeah, we're, we're sorry about that. Were there? Let's try again here. Oops. Okay. I think this will work. Can you see this? Yep. Okay. Uh, Gabby, you can make that. Okay. Um, this is on the federal property and the wildlife corridor continues westward. It comes down and crosses Irvine Boulevard and enters into the planned portion of the wildlife corridor, which I showed you earlier. This is the portion of the wildlife corridor that's set aside on exclusively for wildlife. And this is built as part of the five point um, Great Park Communities development. And we're partnering with them to try to help build this. We worked with science advisors to come up with a plan for that particular portion of the wildlife corridor. Now we're entering the area that's known as um, the strawberry fields. We're, we're crossing the I-5 freeway here, entering into the denser, uh, more urbanized Irvine spectrum area. And here's where we're working on the remnant portion of the wildlife corridor, where we're trying to link together these flood control parcels and put them into a meaningful connection for wildlife. Now we're crossing Lake Forest Boulevard and going up V Creek where the wildlife corridor will um, basically end at Barbara's Lake at the top of V's Creek. And that essentially is the wildlife corridor. That is the, the five to six mile area that I discussed earlier, where it's linking the two large areas, open space areas. Uh, let's see, Gabby, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so this, this talks about how we're using a science-based process for trying to fix wildlife connectivity in the Irvine spectrum. But this same idea basically applies to our larger project. We're, we're trying to, to, to one, really collect scientific data. In this case, we're trying to collect stuff, our data from the 2007 USGS collar study. We're also trying to collect um, info from uh, our own camera study. And we're trying to bring that together along with our on the ground conditions. Because of the pandemic, we're having to work with our science advisors and have a virtual tour of the on the ground conditions throughout the Irvine spectrum area. And taking both the data and assessing the on the ground conditions, we're trying to develop solutions that we think ameliorate or fix some of the issues that we've found. Taking all of that together, we're trying to take these solutions and go to the next step, which is create funding and project implementation for improvements. So they may be things that I discussed earlier, such as smaller things like more landscape. Maybe they're a critter shelf in some of, underneath some of the um, bridges. Maybe they're um, a soil concrete walk for wildlife. Maybe it's part of an educational um, campaign for neighbors. So these are all things that we're trying to do that solve some of the issues. Next slide, please. 
This slide is a snapshot of our science advisors. We worked with many of these great folks to develop the uh, wildlife corridor plan for the five points area. And that is the portion of the corridor, which we talked about earlier called the planned corridor. These, a lot of these people helped put that plan together. And we're going to continue working with them to try to create solutions for uh, the project one area and also the issues at the I-5 freeway. Next slide, please. So this is the slide that Terry referenced earlier. And I think, I think everybody understands the idea that we're trying to link the two core habitat areas, the Santa Ana Mountains to the coastal area. And that, just, that talks about the idea of an island effect or the fragmentation of open space and habitat areas. But in Upper Newport Bay, there's also been some work by um, one of our science advisors to try to link these areas together. And the question becomes, how do you take small remnant open space areas and start to put them together? And Seaman, uh, one of our um, science advisors, actually went in and did uh, roadkill studies and looked at the viability of creating connections along what she's on the Sand Canyon Wash Corridor and the Bonita Creek Canyon Corridor. And that essentially will link Upper Newport Bay back to the larger Laguna Greenbelt area. So it's this idea of fragmentation as it starts to go down the chain in smaller areas and connecting all of these areas together. That essentially is what a wildlife corridor is and about, and it's essentially what we're trying to do here. And I'm going to hand it back to Terry, who's going to talk about some larger implications of what we're trying to do with the wildlife corridor and some of the other initiatives that she's working on. Thank you, Terry. All right, I have to say, I'm so impressed with this group. I'm, I'm trying to follow the chat. Peter, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to come into play here in a minute when we finish up the presentation. So um, obviously like you, we work um, in areas of restoration, as you heard Lance, what are the remediations along the corridor that are needed so that we have a functioning corridor from core area to core area, education, advocacy, and research. So uh, in addition to sort of the projects, we call them the remediation projects, we are also standing up another sort of discrete project that we feel not only fits, um, fits a problem in our area, but also is, is, a, is perhaps a model that could be used more broadly. So we've, we've taken the idea of bird safe standards, bird safe measures that was um, initiated by the Audubon Society and what we're thinking is that we've got um, wildland urban inter interfaces, not just in Orange County, but throughout California and in the, in the world that um, really demand uh, wildlife measures. So the idea is um, to basically create uh, two prongs to the stack. One prong is, is educational materials for people who live and recreate around these wildlife areas and corridors. And the other is to inform planning, policy, and permitting that would be used um, in anyone writing a general plan all the way down to potentially a development checklist as part of their application to ensure that their development project is as wildlife safe as possible. Um, so anyway, we, we think this is a bit of a model and we have the advantage of this amazing deck of science advisors who are bringing existing examples to bear on this as we create the template. Next slide. Um, another issue we are starting to turn our attention to and no doubt you are facing similar challenges, overuse or overloving our parks and open space, which obviously um, is, is more uh, of, a, of a challenge than ever with people during COVID times needing to go out and not only recreate, but 
reboot um, in our parks and open space. And so um, this has been a national problem um, for some time in our national parks and state parks. And obviously the national park system has long before we have thought about some of the solutions, including closing off areas to people during um, popping season or breeding season. Um, those are uh, kind of hammer solutions for a local um, situation. So we are really starting with the research to assess the challenge and then start the dialogue with partners, but have obviously a range of potential solutions, some of them less draconian, some of them more. Obviously, increased education of users is, is critical. Uh, next slide. So kind of last but not least um, in my set is, is just the alignment we're starting to see with not just state policy and law, but also national policy. And with that policy alignment, as you all so well know, comes usually comes funding. Um, so I don't want to dwell here, but it, it's pretty exciting to see both the Biden administration and the Newsom administration in California um, both release executive orders within a month of one another calling for 30% protection of our land and water. And as you all well might know, it's not just 30% protection, it's actually 50% by 2050. 30% by 2030, 50% by 2050. Um, we're also in, in a great place in California because of the California Environmental Quality Act, which requires development projects to disclose and um, if there are significant impacts to wildlife corridors to mitigate those. So we're watching the legislation closely. There are a couple of, of bills, one federal and one local pending that specifically call out wildlife corridor conservation um, and provide for, for more funding for the kind of work that we're, we're doing in Orange County. Um, I am gonna hand the baton over to Gabby. Gabby is gonna talk a little bit about uh, our education program via social media and communications. Yes, thank you, Terry. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about a lot of the technical aspects of the actual project and the science um, around that and the research that has been done. And all of that is um, absolutely essential and the bedrock of the project, but the other aspect of this is also um, communication with the public, communication with our elected officials, our leaders, um, with you know our uh, partners such as Five Point, um, the city of Irvine, all of these uh, folks that we need to really communicate what we're doing, why it's important, um, just an increased amount of awareness around these issues is always a good thing for these projects. That's the only way that we're um, gonna get to the other side of this. So uh, to that end, Laguna Greenbelt has been making an effort to provide more information and create more opportunities um, to get the word out about what's going on in Orange County. This past year, um, I counted close to a dozen articles that were written for one reason or another about uh, the work that Laguna Greenbelt is doing, which is wonderful for the wildlife corridor, for the Greenbelt, and even for um, you know the Newport Bay area, uh, just that increase of awareness that people have is always good uh, to increase the value around um, our natural environment. So another kind of new area for the Greenbelt has been online media, and we've been really ramping this up the last few years. We now have Instagram, Facebook accounts, uh, Twitter, and even a YouTube channel. Um, and all of that is, you know, can only help to continue this conversation with the public. And the other great thing about online media is it allows us to kind of diversify the audience. Um, it tends to be a little bit more informal, so we can talk about a lot of different types of subjects that aren't necessarily, um, you know, only pertinent to 
the specific mission that we have or this specific project. So this is great. And we've even, we had a um, high school intern this year who's been wonderful in helping me with the Instagram account. So, um, you know, we've come up with a lot of different types of messages that we want to put out there about um, not just the science and not just the project details, but also some social issues um, that we care about that pertain to protecting our, um, our habitats. And, you know, talking about different um, diversified audiences, you know, looking at who are the different people groups that live in Orange County, how can we, um, you know, bring them into that conversation in a meaningful way, and, and maybe in a way that they haven't been as um, in the past. So if you do social media, uh, please follow us. We are, like I said, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and we do put out videos occasionally, and um, those are always fun to watch. And additionally, we have an, a newsletter. Um, if you go to the project website, which is wildlifecorridor.org, and click on the Get Involved tab, you'll see where um, you can sign up for the newsletter, and that comes usually monthly or bi-monthly. We don't spam your account or anything. So <laughs> if you're interested in hearing more about that or um, hearing, you know, what can you do to help as action items come up, please follow us. And um, yeah, with that, we are opening it up to questions and I'm sure wonderful um, conversation that we can have with all you folks about this and hear your thoughts on all of it. We have a couple. We have a couple items I'm not sure we covered in the chat. Let's get, let's go back to a couple of those and then open it up uh, further. So Barbara's Lake is part of the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park, but Peter, you also asked whether it was the, I believe whether the lake is connected to the corridor, Lance. Uh, it, it it is. Um, it's it's part of the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park, and it's named after uh, Barbara Stewart, one of the uh, founding board members for Laguna Greenbelt. Um, and it is uh, connected to the corridor via V Creek, which goes down into IRC land. So it's a mishmash of different parcels, but yes, it is. Irvine Ranch Conservancy, IRC. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I speak in, yes. And um, we have another really great question, the core habitat. So when we talk about core, we're talking about the 22,000 acre Laguna Coast wilderness. Wilderness, good. Largely protected. And the much larger natural communities conservation plan area on the Santa Ana Mountains or Cleveland side. Um, within those NCCP areas and the wilderness, they, the cores are largely protected, but that does not mean there aren't some inholdings um, and rural developments in and around the edges or lower density development in and around the edges. There are also large projects that have been proposed adjacent to the wildlife corridor in Irvine um, that in, in addition to all the other work we do, um, we have engaged in uh, challenges of those projects were necessary to protect to protect the corridor. Lance, did you want to add anything? No, well, uh, we could talk about how we've been working with the developer at Five Point to try to come up with strategies for doing these things. It's part of a larger ongoing uh, communication with Five Point. But an example of those type of projects are the county property was proposing a high density uh, housing immediately adjacent to the wildlife corridor. And we uh, essentially challenged that project, uh, in addition to another related project in court and were victorious. And so now that project is going back to the drawing board. But what we're trying to do is always be looking for projects that could impact wildlife movement between the two large open space areas. So Peter has a lot to bring to this party. I'm, I, I think we should unmute Peter. Um, so Peter has another great question. Is, is it a wetlands corridor as well as a terrestrial corridor? And the answer is, um, it is wetlands, riparian, and terrestrial. Yeah. Um, I'd love Lance 
to add to that, and, and I wish we had Elizabeth with us tonight, and Peter, you may want to elaborate. Um, in addition to um, the uh, areas that Lance has shown you um, that we're really working intensively on to identify barriers for wildlife, um, successful wildlife passage, uh, the reach that goes through Irvine that Five Points is building currently, and we showed you the picture of, um, that will also have uh, features in it, including, I believe, temporary water features. But Lance, do we have any permanent? Yeah, uh, so if you recall, uh, I talked about the two different conditions of the planned condition and the remnant. In the planned, uh, it's essentially, it's all on five point land. And there it's, uh, it's largely a dry wildlife corridor. There are some areas that are going to be wet areas, but come across that area. Uh, well, well, hold on, let me, let me back up. The, the area nearest the strawberry fields is going to be immediately adjacent to Serrano Creek. But the wildlife corridor is going to, itself is going to be built on a bench adjacent to the creek. So if you can imagine the bench up here and the creek down here. Uh, in the Irvine spectrum area, however, there are many water areas. That is essentially um, a large evolving wetlands that the Irvine company has received permits for uh, to mow and clear waterways uh, annual, on an annual basis. That area from Serrano flows into Newport, uh, into, um, into San Diego Creek, which flows into Newport Bay. So literally everything is connected with this wildlife corridor, not only with water, but also on the land. I can say unequivocally, this is the smartest group we've addressed recently. Yes. Okay. Not to diminish the presentation by the LCC. All right, who will manage? So uh, this is also on our list. Um, right now there's an agreement through the five point development project with the city of Irvine for five years of maintaining that planned reach. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, we are looking to um, create a stewardship group, um, a funded stewardship group to manage the whole thing. Unlike Northern California, we don't have um, the kinds of partners we might have if we had an open space authority or district or um, a large well-heeled land trust. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at the existing entities that could manage, could expand their mission to management, as well as potentially inventing something new. Um, educate homeowners who live adjacent. This is exactly uh, the prong of wildlife safe measures we hope to actually have a draft of pretty soon. Um, the, the education pieces for homeowners. Why? Well, um, because Gabby is basically uh, uh, modernizing some excellent pieces that Elizabeth Brown had a hand in drafting. And we hope to be making those available to organizations like yours, but also homeowners associations that, um, that live uh, adjacent to wildlife quarters and even more broadly after, after that, maybe having even OC Park push this information out. Um, and we'd love to have any of you volunteer to engage with us, by the way, on, on that education pieces. And if I may, um, yeah, agree, uh, one of the things we've been discussing uh, potentially is working with the homeowner associations. So like, for example, if somebody is in touch with their homeowner association and they have some kind of publication, it's great to just put little pieces in every month or um, I know some of the homeowner associations have newsletters, you know, that sort of thing. So the, those are just some creative ideas that um, we've been discussing behind the scenes that I hope that we can uh, work with the community. If I, if I could chime in here, uh, what, what's interesting about what they're talking about going in and trying to educate the neighbors in a large part of Irvine Spectrum, it's office and industrial, but there's, there's residential uh, complex that is being built that will have, uh, I believe, 7,000 residents when completed. So it's going to be a challenge. Not only are you going to be trying to educate the office, office building 
residents and uh, tenants, but you're also going to be having to educate the residents of a um, residential community. There's different types of uses there. Office people are gonna operate a little bit differently than the residential folks. And so uh, we, we really have sort of a, a challenging path ahead of us to try to go and work and educate those folks. But I'm extremely excited about this and try to be able to work with the city and the developers also. Jan Janet's j fabulous. We've already got a volunteer. So, um, and, and one of the prongs of the education pieces we've been talking about, since we've got a lot of new users of our parks and open space is something along the lines of leave no trace, um, you know, respect the area. So th this is great to have a volunteer. This is a lively topic and not just in our corner of California. Um, we have an easy one, Lance. Uh, you mentioned that wildlife will go we're trying to get wildlife to go from east to west. Can they go back again? Yes, they can. I mean, the idea is that obviously um, wildlife corridors are, are made to, you know, if you think about a, a fire, unfortunately, if you have a fire in Laguna Canyon, you also want wildlife to go back and be able to use that area as a sort of an emergency escape valve and be able to go back the opposite direction. But you also ideally want a portion of this wildlife corridor to serve as habitat. That's what would be ideal, is if we could be creating more habitat along the way. So um, this is a great question. Species that we're targeting. Ah, oh, someone, Rita, you're a mind reader. All right, uh, mountain lion. So let's just go there. So we um, obviously uh, use as the species to define success um, include bobcat, coyotes. It's it's the bobcats that um, we no none of our larger mammals do we think are making it through the I five tunnel, and we're going to come back to that big scary tunnel in a moment. Um, but basically, what you what you select are target species that if they can make it through the corridor, you may attract other other species that haven't been in, in our area for a while, but have been there uh, like um, big cats and deer. Um, so Lance, I don't know if you want to add anything to the focal species, but- um, the, the, So, so big the big cats, cats there, there really are no, for all intents and purposes, there's really no big cats that are, that haven't been over on this side of the I-5 in 25 years. And we know that there's a few that have gotten into the federal property, but uh, beyond that, they really aren't making it across that. So th oh, there are- two. We have, we have um, one of our science advisors and we have another one joining that are world-class um, big cat experts, um, Winston Vickers um, and another gentleman named Chris Wilmers. And we've had this conversation, you know, and we'll continue it. it. Is it a good idea? Is it a good idea to try to create something that might be attractive to big cats to move uh, into the limited coastal area? And um, honestly, you all, it's gonna be an ongoing discussion with our science advisors. Is it possible uh, when we have a fully functioning corridor for a big cat to make it across um, yeah, absolutely possible. And I think that's where you have to have good education and management regimes in place. Um, and also great relationships with the agencies that can be called upon if one of the big cats wanders into a place that's unsafe for them, like one did during COVID downtown San Francisco. Um, so more on that with you all later. Um, the I-5. So obviously, ideally, up uh, P22, yep. I mean, we have good big cats, right? Most of them are, most of them know how to behave. We're the ones who don't. Um, so the I-5 is obviously one of our targets. And um, the science advisors will be not only working with us using the virtual tour a tool, 
but also something called um, a connectivity assessment tool that was developed by one of the advisors that helped work on the final design for the reach through the city of Irvine, the five point reach, um, Patty Kramer out of the University of Utah. And um, we ultimately believe in our heart of hearts that were we to rate the undercrossing, even if we were to improve lighting and we were to remove standing water and we were to um, do other remediate, maybe critter shelves, other remediations to that I-5 tunnel that is what, 1200 feet long, Lance? Yes. That we, yeah. Have, yeah. that we have a failed condition there. It would get an F under the assessment tool we're using. It's more than 300 feet long by many fold. So we ultimately are not afraid of the real possibility that we have to design um, and build an overcrossing at some point. And the good news there is that overcrossings are now in the US, in the Western states and Canada. Um, and uh, one is planned actually up to the north of us in Liberty Canyon that's getting quite a lot of press for, where is that, P22. Um, and we think it's not only likely feasible, but likely essential for a fully functioning corridor. Now, could somebody make a run through that big scary tunnel once a generation? If we put a few other um, remediations into place, maybe, um, maybe. And that's why we're kind of testing some of these um, along Laguna Canyon Road and, and elsewhere, so. Um, oh, yes, butterflies and birds. Lance, do you want to tackle this one? Uh, uh, I think the benefit of, of, of obviously being a butterfly or a bird is that you don't have to deal with some of the land-based uh, problems that uh, maybe a bobcat would have. And so they're able to fly over that area. There are areas within the planned reach that I know that they've looked at, the scientists I've looked at and trying to create areas for, for birds. And, uh, you know, in fact, um, I believe that that's what the whole purpose of planting all that cactus is, is to try to help the cactus wren. And there is, and I don't remember the number of acres, but a good portion of the planned reach is all going to be planted in cactus for the cactus wren. And that was done in conjunction so with the agencies. Yeah, and, and then like, Peter is so. Yeah. Go ahead, Gabby. Oh, no, I was just going to mention, you know, we've identified like lizard species in that area. Um, and then you also have to remember that animals carry plants, right? So even plants will benefit from having these animals move between the ecosystems, um, you know, insects, all of that. So, you know, we sort of focus on the apex predators because they are the keystone species. And um, if you can take care of them, the rest of the ecosystem benefits. I mean, I mean, the real benefit of building a corridor is ideally, again, there'd be habitat there for multi-species. And uh, th th that's very hard to do. This almost has never been done where you build an area on the Western portion, the planned area. In Southern California, I know no other area where they're building a wildlife corridor of this size just in an area just for wildlife. So um, yeah, I'm very hopeful. So I think we need to unmute Peter because I'm oh, really curious oh. to put the question back. Um, should we be um, should we be planting the larval food plant, the false indigo, uh, to support the California dog face? And, and it seems like a really interesting idea to me. Um, can we there's Peter. Well, that, that, that's one example of um, yes. larval food plants that could be included uh, and not take up too much space. And um, we can easily come up with a list that's already been done. And um, I don't know when you'll be developing a plant list, but I would vote for including larval food plants for, for butterflies. Yeah. 
You know, the plant list is actually part of the educational materials we're working on, Peter. Mm -hmm. So we would we would be delighted to get your plant list. Oh, easy. Yeah, right. Great. <laughs> Great. Um, if if there is um, a creek included in, in the corridor, um, I wasn't clear on to what extent that's going all the way from one end to the other, but um, usually if there's a creek, then there's there are plant communities that are typically associated with it, like willows close to the creek and then sycamores a little, little further back. I mean, is all of that included? I'm sorry to be so ignorant about what's in the plan already, but. Uh, so, so there, Peter, there's some of that, there's some of that because yeah. uh, in the plan portion, there isn't much. Uh, the problem is uh, a lot of the creeks in this area have been channelized. So yes. there, there really is no, no creek to speak of. There's a small remnant portion of the San Diego, historic San Diego Creek. And then it sort of goes into a tunnel and you have a dry area. Yeah. And then you go into a semi-channelized area. So the quality of the type of plantings that you're talking about and the diversity mm. probably aren't there, but that's, I think, part of a larger conversation uh, that hopefully once we establish um, some areas that can be managed in such a way that allow for people to open their minds about what we're going to do in other areas, mm. then I think that lends itself to this type of conversation. Uh, is, there, is there funding available for Unchannelizing. Uh, hmm. um, I'm not sure that 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 is. I'm not a hydrologist, but some hmm. of the the amount of volume of water that we're talking in some of these areas is just incredible. It's like um, you know, uh, one of the tunnels that we're talking about is 25 feet wide, 15 feet high, and 1,800 feet long, and it fills during peak times, it fills almost all the way to the top. So the Beautiful. volume of water is just incredible. So you start to see what the parameters are about trying to unchannelize something, because as you know, if you want to try to unchannelize it, you need lots of room to capture this volume of water. And in many cases, that simply doesn't exist in today's, um, in, in the footprint today. Well, San Diego Creek is, uh, I think it's um, concrete sides and a, a natural bottom, isn't it? At least down. Yes, yes, it is. Close, close to Newport Bay. Uh, is, is that something that can be included in planning? So it's a. Uh, that, that, is beyond, that is beyond our sort of study area. But I would, would say that a lot of people are trying to think about how, how that can happen. Yeah. Yes. But to be clear, there is no continuous water feature creek through the two and a half mile Irvine planned reach. Um, but there will be places where there is temporary water. And of course, um, as it approaches the I-5, I think you're raising some really great and interesting issues that we should discuss uh, with Five Point as that final stretch gets planned. Yes. A topic you guys are all very familiar with since you're in a watershed that <laughs> has to be managed critically for your, for the Bay. Um, oh yeah, the LA River, Janet, is another um, incredible example of a huge, infrastructure project we built, and now we're trying to restore. Um, yeah. Janet, can you send us more information about the LA River project? Janet? Okay. Yeah, it's a great project and the, the success of the coalitions working on it is, is something to behold. 
um, including setting up one of, I think, the first for conservation purposes, what's called an EIFD, oh great, uh, Infrastructure Financing District. I'm, I'm forgetting what the E stands for, but um, yeah, that's a great project to send a synopsis around on. Um, because as we know, we have a highly built watershed upstream from the Newport Bay as well. Third most populous county says everything to the challenges. Oh, great. And she's already dropped it in there. Fabulous. So um, I'm curious what any of you think about uh, the idea that we would expand our study area to include a connection between our connections and the Upper Newport Bay, or if that is not a good idea. I mean, um, CNM's work showed a lot of road roadkill, um, as there are the kinds of pinch points on those reaches that we're discussing and trying to remediate on ours. But I'm just curious what you all think. What well, was the question? Would uh, you take um, into interest, account Upper Newport Bay somehow? Interest in connect better connecting the Upper Newport Bay um, with our corridor. Those are the two two small corridors that I showed at the end of the process. The challenge there is. Uh, lack of area and adjacency to roads and what the implications are to some of those areas. It doesn't mean that it can't be done with proper fencing. It just means that the, the, the issue really needs to be studied. Oh, thank you, Gabby, for bringing that up. Yeah. I so, mean, at the, very, at, at the very least, we are worried about the roadkill numbers and it would be good to fence um, just to deal with that. But Lance, why don't you talk about the one that has the higher chance of success here if we focused on it? Um, I would think I would think that it would be uh, Bonita Creek, but um, I haven't studied it much. I would think it would be Bonita Creek because of the fact that the other Sand Canyon is adjacent to a road. Uh, I think fencing would be difficult there. The toll road already has fencing. I believe there's tunnels that exist there. The question is, is, is how that works in the lower portion of that. Uh, Elizabeth Brown and I had some conversations about how the net catchers, for example, would, would come across that area and whether it was really working. And um, I think there were some minor studies that were done, but I do not remember uh, there being a formalized study on that area. And also, we're not familiar with the terrestrial species that occupy the Upper Newport Bay. I mainly think about the avian species, but obviously, CNM, um, CNM saw a lot of activity by coyotes, which is not surprising, none by bobcats. And, you know, the other consideration here is do we, do we really want to be attracting, if, if we were doing that, attracting? Um, you know, uh, larger mammals in, into into your area. So I, I'd be curious what you all think, whether Peter has an opinion about that or anyone else. Well, uh, we did have bobcats in Upper Newport Bay up until I don't know how many years ago. Um, so I, I think that would be a natural thing to accept. And it would certainly be exciting to watch. Sure would. Um, there are also areas between Upper Newport Bay and the Audubon Ponds. Um, the there's a big area that's that's owned by University of California, and I think they're going to put a big hospital up there, but it won't occupy all of the potential wilderness areas. So. Um, it, I think it'd be important to, to look at what's, what's being planned for that hospital and see if there can be some mitigation that would be used to help the corridor. Great. I see there's a question about the 15 freeway. Uh, one of our science advisors, Trish Smith, is working on a connection across the 15 freeway, um, I believe adjacent to Temecula, but I would have 
to get a map out, but I believe that's where. Uh, so the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, there are, uh, the, the way I think about our wildlife corridor and the wildlife corridor plan for the 15 and Liberty Canyon, I think they're all very much uh, going to be issues of how uh, we are in the future going to be able to address uh, climate change and adaption to what the future is going to be in an urbanized area. How can we make what we're trying to do work in conjunction with the challenges of climate change? Whether we su succeed or not will be the answer. A uh, great question um, about educating folks again about um, behavior around wildlife. Um, Gabby, do you want to talk about the rodenticide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is a wonderful question. It's also very important. Um, you know, as many of you know, the rodenticides that we have been using um, also affect bobcats, coyotes, uh, owls, hawk, you know, all kinds of um, predators because the bio uh, magnifies as it goes up the food chain. So um, luckily last year, the state of California did put a moratorium on the second generation anticoagulants, which are the really bad rodenticides that people have been using. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of education to still be done about removing some of those boxes that have already been put into the environment. Um, a lot of businesses, again, homeowner associations and uh, professional uh, pest management companies, um, you know, they still need to be, edu be educated on that new law. And uh, that's just, you know, doing the footwork on that. So again, with um, writing articles is important, you know, any letters to the editors. If you see a box when you go to the grocery store, which I often do, <laughs> um, you know, talk to the manager. I mean, think little things like that do make a difference. And, you know, I think we all just need to do our part to educate those in our lives where we have spheres of influence. Uh, we did do a social media campaign around this uh, recently. So we, at times, we'll do this. Um, so yeah, if you see something like that, please share our posts on social media, you know, join us and, and helping towards that effort. That's also very important to keep our wildlife healthy. Didn't I just see an article in the LA times that said that 80% of bald eagles have uh, rodent inside inside when they've done studies. I believe that was the oh, figure. I, I was, I, I, I was, I was actually shocked at how high that number was. Wow. I mean, our, you know, American bird, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, it's I'm really loving that, that Peter's volunteer and Peter Baller. Well, we'll reach oh. out to him at the hospital and then maybe uh, it would make sense for him to join the science advisors as well. That's great. Um, you know, there's a really great program up at Tahoe, the Take Care campaign. And I was uh, telling our team that it would be great if we got so well coordinated um, in our area that we had the kinds of um, messaging and signage um, as the wildlife enjoy our area to educate people about not feeding them, um, et cetera, that was coordinated because I think it would save costs. So, you know, that may be an evolution as we get more deeply into education, but it's great to see that others are already in that space. And we have to give a shout out to Bettina is it who lobbied for the rodenticide bill. Fabulous. Hand up, Janet. Oh, she needs to be taken off mute. Hillary's getting, there we go. Hey, I was clapping. I was trying to clap for Bettina, <laughs> but it looked like I put my hand up. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I actually have to go, but this was enlightening. I appreciate it very much. Well, we appreciate you showing up tonight and listening, but, um, and, and making some really great suggestions that you will see us follow up on, Janet included. <laughs> so thank you, Janet. Thank you. 
Oh, well, same thing. Yes, you should say advocated. Yeah, let's not cross any 501c3 lines. <laughs> um, other questions? This has been a lot of fun for us. Oh, another great suggestion by Peter. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Yep. We agree. Next, next thing we all have to work on. And I think, aren't they doing that in Europe already? Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Rogers Gardens does not sell anything with neonicotinoids in it or any plants that have been treated with neonicotinoids. Mm -hmm. So we could educate other plant nurseries about that too. Okay. And another wonderful group um, in this area is all of the non-toxic groups in Orange County. So there's one for Laguna Beach. There's one for Irvine. And there was a question here about how to talk uh, to store managers. And I, I think um, working with an organization like non-toxic neighborhoods, I think is the, the umbrella organization, they have so many toolkits for this. This is like their bread and butter. Mm -hmm. um, I know the, the one in Irvine is very active and they even have like an office of the city, I think that they work out of. So uh, if, you, if you just Google non-toxic Irvine um, or a non-toxic Laguna Beach or non-toxic, you know, whatever city. Thank you. And so helpful to have other partners leading on some of these topics that we can nimbly follow. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Wow. Well, Hillary, I, I don't know if we're ready to wrap this up or not. I, you're the you're the mind reader on that score. Well, it does look like our questions are kind of slowing down. Um, I just want to thank you, all the three of you, for being here and for educating us all about your project. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, I do have information about our next Naturalist Night, which will be um, next month on May 13th. That is the second Thursday of the month, um, same time, 6 o'clock. We're gonna be shifting focus a little bit towards social impact. So our presentation next month is going to be specifically on sustainable investing, uh, which is not a topic that we've had for one of our naturalist nights before. So that should be an interesting one. Um, stay tuned for more info on that. I will be up on Eventbrite, hopefully by beginning of next week. Um, and just thank you all for being here. Thank you, appreciate thank you it. Thanks, everybody.